So picture this. My boss at the music, digital music company I was working for at the time is being driven around in a beautiful 50s Chevrolet convertible across his vast ranch in California by multi-platinum singer-songwriter Neil Young. And Neil Young is talking very excitedly to my boss about this new product that he'd been working on, which was going to change the world of recorded music. Can anyone guess which product he was talking about? Four-letter word, not offensive. He was talking about the Pono, a yellow Toblerone-shaped music device which would get everyone access to high-quality audio. And its mission was to eradicate poor-quality audio forever. But it didn't. At the music company I worked for, we thoroughly assessed the opportunity, decided not to partner with Pono, it only sold 10,000 devices globally and was taken out of production within a year. Clearly, from the moment that Neil Young announced the Pono to the world, the world had moved on. People didn't want to use separate devices anymore and were actually quite happy with the quality of the music coming out of their smartphone. But Pono isn't the only well-publicized product failure in recent years. What to think of Quibi, a content streaming platform that crashed and burned spectacularly within the space of a year. Or Segway, <laughs> two-wheeled, self-balancing electric vehicle that was supposed to revolutionize the world of transport. It didn't. It lacked a clear target audience or a clear problem to solve. And finally, my favorite product failure, the Juicero, which if anything demonstrates that people aren't willing to pay 400 bucks for a machine that simply squeezes out juice packets. Right? <laughs> Waste of time. Compare that to the thousands of prototypes that James Dyson had to go through to finally land on a vacuum cleaner bag that successfully separates dirt from air. James Dyson effectively had to, if you compare what he did to all those product failures, double his failure rate to get to product success. And this is the concept of failing forward, the idea that each failure brings you one step closer to success. As long as you take those learnings into account and use them for each next step. And as product people, we love this concept of failing forward, or as Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn, calls it, failing fast. We should be embarrassed by the first version of our product or a feature that we're launching. I've got another quote for you on that one. <laughs> just don't know who it is. Must be a product person. I'm just going to look around to see, see some people that could be me. Yep. Yeah. I know who it is. It's me. It's the reason I'm standing here in front of you today, because I've had my fair share of product failures. But that's not the only reason. The other reason is that I've seen the tug of war that happens within organizations of product managers wanting to fail fast and the rest of the organization that doesn't. Because there are pressures and pressures that are real, commercial pressures. Think about meeting sales targets or having to go to your CFO and telling them that your product has just failed. Resource constraints where, especially if you're working in a smaller organization, you've got limits when it comes to time, people and budget, or how do you even square a rock solid two year product roadmap with product failure? Or competitive pressures where there's no room to try and experiment or to fail because we just have to do a fast follow of what the competitor has just launched. And finally, there's concerns about brand and reputation. What will product failure mean to the brand of our organization? Or what will the impact be on other products in our portfolio? So today, we're going to talk about that tension. The tension between creating wanting to fail fast versus limited room to do so. I can't guarantee that your product won't fail, because there is a likelihood that product will fail. But what it will do is give you the practical tools and techniques to make sure that, if anything, your product won't fail in vain. Now, if we think about products not failing in vain, we first have to understand two different types of failure. The first type of product failure is instant. Your product is like this very kind of brittle sculpture that will 
scatter with a single touch. Think about Quibi or Juicero. Compare that to more delayed failure, where it's more gradual. Your product has a good run at it. Think about BuzzFeed or Clubhouse, but will eventually fail. Now, I want you to think about your product and its value proposition and think about how robust is my product and its value proposition. If we take this man, Thomas Edison, you know, he had a fair share of failures. He submitted nearly 2,000 patents, only a few of which were very successful. And similar to James Dyson, who we saw earlier, no one in their right mind would consider Thomas Edison a failure, nor his products. So it raises the question about the point at which we need to start worrying about product failure. Now, I believe that we need to start worrying about product failure if we stop learning through our product. So typically, a product will have a learning curve, which starts with what I call the experimental playground. You've just launched your product, you're learning a ton about the solution, how people are using it or not, quality expectations, and as long as we take those learnings and use them to iterate on the product in such a way it delivers tangible customer benefits, not all is lost. It's at the point when your product is a sunk investment that we really need to start worrying about product failure. And that happens typically when we don't learn, learn anything new through our product or we don't learn anything worth acting upon. Right? And I'm conscious that that learning curve will look different if you're working on a direct-to-consumer app or website with lots of users and there's plenty of room to experiment and run A-B tests versus working on medical software or hardware product. Because in the case of a medical software product or hardware, you still have that learning curve, but it will look differently. Typically, the experimental phase is a lot longer and you need to have a lot more confidence before you go to market. So you have that phase before launch where you need to make some really critical decisions about technology that you're gonna use, the commercials, right? But the learning curve is still there. And what that means for us as product managers is that we need to have this skill where we can call time on a product or feature at the right time. So we need to move away from negativity around products failing and it's a blemish on your reputation as a product manager, but really develop that skill of, no, I called the product failure at the right time. Right? And to do that, we need to be cognizant of the risks inherent in our products. Each of these risk types, problem risk, solution risk, execution risk and timing risk, in their own right can cause a product to fail. Let's look at them in a bit more detail. Juicero is a great example of a problem risk. There was no problem to solve. It was, instant, it was an instant failure, right? But equally, you can have a problem that is simply not big enough, not commercially viable enough to make it worth solving. Think about the Pono and the problem of high quality audio. If you take Quibi as a great example of execution of uh, solution risk, where the solution wasn't desirable from a customer point of view, and it wasn't scalable from a technical point of view. The Zune, which was um, Microsoft's response to Apple's iPod at the time, suffered from execution risk, where the product team behind the Zune didn't have the necessary app support skills, user interface design skills to successfully execute the Zune product idea. And finally, if we think about timing risk, the question is, has the technology moved on enough for it to be ready for a new product? Is the market there? If you think back to the launch of Google Glass, the question arises whether the market has moved on enough for it to be ready for the Apple Vision Pro. So what that means for us as product managers is that we constantly need to be aware of these risks. We constantly need to assess them we need to prioritize them and try to mitigate the biggest risks. And to do that, we need to develop some confidence about the likelihood of these risks rising and the impact that they might have. And we can do that by just listing these risk types and assessing our confidence. And by doing that, you'll very quickly establish whether you're looking at a quick win or a big bet. Because a quick win, we typically have a lot of confidence about the problem that we're looking to solve. We are confident that people will adopt the solution. We know what we need to do to build the solution. And therefore, 
the chances of the product failing are relatively low. Downside is, or consequence is, that the expected return, the expected value is going to be equally low. If you compare that to a big bet, where we have high confidence in the problem that we're looking to solve, because we see a unique opportunity to market, but there's lots of unknowns and uncertainty about whether people are going to adopt a solution or whether we can even build it and how complex it's going to be. Right? So therefore, the chances of the product failing are very high. However, if you get it right though, the returns, and if you think about products like the iPhone or Amazon Prime, the returns are going to be significant. Right? Another way of framing big bets and quick wins is using the exploit and explore continuum by strategizer, where on the exploit end of the spectrum, you have your quick wins because you're building on existing foundations, you're acting, operating in known territory. Whereas with big bets, you're exploring uncertainty. There's a lot more trial and error that you have to go through. And to do that, to, to underpin that confidence, we need data. And it boils down to these four data points. We need data about the problem that we're looking to solve. We need to have data about the customer, data about the solution. And we need to have data as inputs for decision making at different stages of the product life cycle. And the crux of not failing in vain, our product's not failing in vain, is the sooner we get those data points, the sooner we get those learnings, the better. And that's why I want to share with you today a simple, simple framework, which is the FAIL framework. What the FAIL framework does, it helps us unlock those critical learnings, those data points, early and often to make sure our products don't fail in vain. And FAIL consists of four components, feature, assumption, impact, and learning. Feature, assumption, impact, and learning. And whether you're working in a small startup or a big corporation, you're working on a direct-to-consumer product or business-to-business -business product, it doesn't matter. The faster you can go through this loop of starting with your features and assumptions, getting to impact and learning, the better. The better and bigger the chances of your product not failing in vain. Let me illustrate that fail framework through a real-life example of a product that I worked on a good few years ago. Product was called Settle Plus, and for context, Settle was a London-based PropTech startup, and we've, our mission was to make the process of buying and selling homes in the UK as simple as possible. Right? We started with a feature, or actually what I would call, we flipped the feature, because it's very tempting as product people to go straight into a product idea, but you want to have a thorough understanding of the problem that you're solving first. And in the case of Settle Plus, the problem that we wanted to solve was the fact that lots of home transactions didn't get completed, which means a buyer and seller agreed, offer was accepted, but then the home wouldn't exchange hands, it would fall, fall through. And that in the UK alone, you get 40% of those home transactions don't get completed, so they don't exchange hands. And our assumption was that the primary reason for those home transactions not being completed was about people finding out about all kinds of issues with the property way after their initial offer on the property had been accepted. And our assumption was that if we could bring all the information about the home forward in the process, so at the point of listing a property on a property website, for example, it would reduce the chances of, or would increase the chances of Completion, that was our assumption. The impact that we're looking to, to drive through Settle Plus was increasing the completion rate, percentages of home purchases completed. And we were after two very specific learnings. First of all, we wanted to learn whether prepackaging homes with all the information up front, issues and all, would help to increase that completion rate. But we also wanted to learn whether home sellers, property lawyers, surveyors were ready to change their ways of working and having to bring all that information up front. Now, Settle Plus was an instant failure. We took it out of production after a few months. And the main risk that materialized here was around timing. Settle's founder wasn't ready to go all in on prepackaged homes. 
And despite a number of successful customer trials, lawyers and surveyors weren't ready to change their established ways of working. But did Settle Plus fail in vain? No, it didn't. Because we tested our riskiest assumptions cost-effectively and early. We got strong signals that the product would meet its desired impact. And we obtained valuable learnings early and often, and we made critical product decisions on the back of those learnings. So let's unpick that sale framework in a bit more detail. Starting with features, and as I said, it's about flipping a feature, really understanding the problem that you're trying to solve. And I agree and disagree with this quote by Katharina Fake, who is co-founder of Flickr, former chair of Etsy, because the whole point of not failing in vain is that you should have an idea of what you're doing. You should at least understand the problem that you're trying to solve. And the easiest and most effective way of communicating the problem that you're trying to solve is through jobs to be done, where you focus on the outcome for your user, your customer. In the case of Settle Plus, it was pretty straightforward. Home buyers, all they really cared about was being able to move into their home as quickly and as easily as possible. And actually, it was the same for home sellers who wanted a seamless home transaction so they could sell their home very quickly and move on. Now, taking those two outcomes, we started working backwards. So we covered our whole office, small office, in uh, post-its, right? And we took those outcomes and we tried to understand what is the current journey that people have to go through to achieve those outcomes. And that helped us to really understand what the points of friction were in that process. The main point of friction was that People look at a property, get the offer accepted, and way after that, they suddenly find out there's all kinds of issues with the property or the land that's been built on, which would cause a lot of anxiety, delays, and ultimately for the home transaction to not go through. Right, so products don't fail in vain if we start off with a thorough understanding of the problem that we're looking to solve. Now, the next component of the fail framework is all about assumptions. And we have four types of assumptions. We have assumptions about the problem, about the user, about the solution, and assumptions about all the things that could go wrong. Let's start with the problem. So first, you want to understand who, who your customers are, what their problems are, and how they currently find their way around solving, their, solving that problem. In the case of Settle Plus, like we said, we believe that customers have a need to buy a home without any hassle. The problem that they're facing is that they find out about all kinds of property, uh, issues with the property late on in the, program, in, the, in the process. So if you establish that problem statement, the next step is to really think about the severity of that problem. So there's two main questions. Would people care about are solving that problem for them? And the second logical next question is, how much would they care about us solving that problem? Would they pay for it? Would they continue to use the solution? And a way to think about the severity of your problem is to think about candies, vitamins, and painkillers. Because if the problem that you're trying to solve is a candy, it means that people, it's something that people have little intent on solving or willingness to pay for, right? Your product is like, you know, it's sugar and sweet. My, people might use it for a few times, but then they'll stop using it because they know it's bad for them. Compare that to a vitamin where people know it's important, but it's not urgent for them. You know, it's that classic thing where people will tell you, I think that's a great idea, or I could totally see myself using that product, and then they walk away and they forget about it because it's not important. Compare that to a painkiller where if there's a pain and your product takes that pain away, the product almost sells itself, right? People won't go through the hassle of price comparison size doing extensive research, because if, if they really have a pain and your product takes that away, they want it now. Second group of assumptions is all about the user. Who is our target user and what do they value? In the case of Settle Plus, we focused on first-time home buyers. That was our primary user group. And we had the assumption that 
particularly because they were new to the process of buying and selling a home, they would place important value on timely information about the property that they wanted to buy. And you take those assumptions, whether it's about the pain points, the jobs to be done, and put them in an ideal customer profile, like this example. That will help you to make sure that you know, you're talking to the right people and you can use this profile to evolve it as you meet more people who might or might not meet this ideal customer profile. Solution assumptions. Again, what do we assume about our solution? Is it going to work? How is it going to work? How will it solve customer problems? What will be the benefits of that solution? It's important to collate those assumptions. Again, in this case of Settle Plus, we believed that we could solve that problem of home transactions falling through the cracks, literally, is putting all that information about any problems with the property, bring that forward in the process, putting that on the side at the point of listing so that A, buyers would have a lot more confidence in the property that they were looking to buy, and sellers would have an opportunity to remedy any issues with the property early on. Now, with solutions, I like this quote from Sheena Iyengar, who's a professor of business at Stanford University. Solutions are often a blend of kind of old ideas, but we all know from experience that not every idea is equal. So the same Sheena Iyengar developed this third eye test in her book, Think Bigger. And the concept of a, th of a third eye test is simple as it is powerful, because what it means is that before you even start prototyping your product idea, you tell someone about it, you tell your target customer about your product idea. And a few days after you've told them, you connect back with them and you ask them to play back that product idea. And what you will get is an edited version of how the target customer, how the other person understood your product. And you'll get a very good idea of what value resonated from that product idea. Final group of assumptions that we need to think about is, as I said, all the things that go wrong with that product. And I love the idea, I love the technique, which is called the pre-mortem, which I've used many times, where you, before you do anything, you get a group of stakeholders in a room and you talk about all the things that go, could go wrong with your product. And you don't look at it just from a product perspective or a technical perspective, you can look at it from a marketing point of view, from a commercial point of view, legal point of view. And what you, start, what you do is you collate all the potential risk, all the things that could go wrong, and you start, you start grouping them, you start prioritizing them, and you start brainstorming about ways to mitigate those risks from happening. Right? So our products don't fail in vain if we learn early and often about those critical assumptions, whether it's about the problem, the user, solution, or the things that could go wrong with your product. And then the penultimate component of the fail framework, which is all about impact. What does success look like? What does good look like for a product or a feature? Now, the best way to capture what success looks like is through a hypothesis statement. Your hypothesis statement needs to be highly measurable, so it's very black and white. It's either right or wrong, but you can prove it or you can't prove it. And what that does, if you think back to that first product mantra, about being able to call time on a product or a feature at the right time, a hypothesis statement will give you the exact signals to look out for. And our job as product people is to understand what those signals would be and have a plan A, B, C in place depending on those signals. And it's typically about go, no go, iterate or terminate. If we take Settle Plus again as an example, our belief was that Settle Plus, bringing all that information forward, would increase the completion rate of home purchases. But well, how did we make that measure measurable? Is if we could see 90% of properties sold through Settle Plus completing within a certain time frame. If you want to go through for a more kind of qualitative signal, you can use a simple product market fit study, which centers around one single question, which is how would you feel if you could no longer use this product. And you'll find that the people who see your product as candy, they will say, um, I wouldn't be disappointed if you were to take this away. People who see it as a vitamin will say, yeah, I'm somewhat disappointed. 
people who treat your product as a painkiller would be very disappointed. And then you can start digging into some of those answers, looking at the forces of progress, understanding what factors are at play that either drive demand, right? Is it price? Is it quality? And what factors are at play that reduce demand? Is it people are set in their ways, switching costs are high, people have formed habits? But the point is that our products don't fail in vain. If we have that clear hypothesis, we are clear on the signals that we're looking for, and we know what decisions we need to make on the back of the, the signals that we see. And we get to the final component of the FAIL framework, which is all about learning. And to really capture and be able to act on our learnings, it boils down to three simple questions. What happened? What did we learn? What did we decide? Now, if you think about understanding what happened, I really encourage you to not just observe, but really go into the why. And I think we're all familiar with the five whys, well known, but it works. It really works to understand what did we observe in terms of the product performance and understanding why things didn't go the way they as planned, or even if they did, really understanding the why behind it. Our product failed. Why? Because people didn't adopt the feature. Why? Because they didn't see the value of the feature. Why? Because they're used to competitive feature X, and so on and so forth. And once you go through the exercise of understanding the learnings and understanding the why behind them, you'll find yourself in one of three solution, uh, situations. One is abject failure. And that's the scenario where we didn't even get anywhere close to our hypothesis. Our value proposition wasn't compelling. And as a result, we shut it down. We go back to the drawing board. Second situation you could find yourself in is that of a near miss, where the hypothesis wasn't proven, but we got some strong signals. And we learned that there was something wrong with part of the product, let's say onboarding. And what do we decide? We go again and we iterate that particular part of the product. Now the third and final situation that you could find yourself in is that of bullseye, right? Where we have a strong hypothesis validation, users clearly got value out of the product, so what do we decide? We optimize. And whether you're in a situation of a near miss, where you need to iterate, or you've got um, a bullseye situation and you need to optimize, you still need to go through these three steps. You still need to make sure that you're crystal clear on the problem that you're trying to solve, crystal clear on the impact that you're looking to make, and also crystal clear on the learnings that you want to obtain and when you want to obtain them and the decisions that you'll make on the back of those learnings. So our products won't fail in vain if we are clear on the why when we look at our learnings. So I've taken you through the four components of the FAIL framework. Features, assumptions, impact, and learning. But let's get real, right? We know that there are still those pressures for us not to fail, for our products not to fail. And that's because of commercial pressures, competitive pressures, brand pressures, resource pressures, but if we use that fail framework to really go through understanding the problem, learning early and often about our critical assumptions, have a clear hypothesis that we can act on early, and we are clear on the why, we will find ourselves in a situation, it's a classic product management situation, where we will fail through our products, we will fail, we will get up, we will learn again, but through using that fail framework, we'll make sure that our products will, will fail in a safe space and they won't fail in vain. And ultimately, we'll deliver a ton of value both to our businesses and to our customers. And with that in mind, I say to you, whatever you do, please, please, please keep failing. Thank you very much.